Hello, my name is Sergeant Harry Tangi, and my job is a Senior Investigating Officer of Serious Injuries and Fatal Road Traffic Collisions. What I find is strange, really, is that people think that they're never going to be involved in an RTC, a serious road traffic collision. It always happens to other people, not to themselves. But what I unfortunately find is it happens to very ordinary people and some quite extraordinary people as well. I'm going to talk to you about one incident, but I've attended over 150 fatalities in my service so far. So I want you to bear in mind, in the back of your minds when I say this, is that this isn't singled out from any of the other fatalities with regards to the despair and destruction that it creates for families. It's 5.30 in the morning and I'm in Columpton. It's a beautiful July morning, the sun's out, it's blue sky. And I'm thinking how unfair it is at the end of my night shift, I'm gonna to have to go back home and go to bed when everyone else is going to the beach. And just then, the radio crackles into life and reports that there's a road traffic collision on the M5, literally just outside Exeter. There's not many cars on the road, it's a beautiful day, so I think, well, hopefully it's not going to be too bad. So I start making my way, and I know that a colleague of mine, Paul, is nearly on scene. Very quickly, he updates on the radio, and he says, this is a serious injury RTC road traffic collision, and I, I really could do with some help. So I continue making my way, and then the radio crackles into life again. And he says, more urgently, I've just found another body in the car. This is a fatality. I really could do with some assistance now. I'm only literally three minutes away by this time, and I arrive, and I can see the hard shoulder at the side of the motorway, there's a big highways truck. It's one of those things with all the big cones and signs on. It's got damage to the rear, and there's skid marks that lead to the middle of the motorway. I can see there's a car, very badly damaged, and it was a convertible, and it was side on, but I couldn't tell what make it was. It was so badly damaged on all four sides, the roof, the, the floor. It was like one of those, mo those modern sculptures, because two of the wheels were actually off the ground. I parked up, and there was no ambulance on scene yet. So I ran to the, the driver of the car. There was a highways man holding his head up so, to clear his airway. But he, the driver, the injured driver, was, was struggling for breath. He was choking on blood coming through his nose and mouth. He was gasping for air. I spoke to him. I asked him his name. I asked him where the pain was. I wanted to get some sort of reaction from him. I don't think he even knew I was there, to be honest. As I put an oxygen mask that we carry on his face, I said to him, it's okay. I know where the injuries are. You're going to be absolutely fine. Now, this was Adam, and he was 23 years old. The oxygen mask, unfortunately, was filling with blood. I had to pour it out and put it on his face again. I was trying to comfort him, give him confidence that everything was under control. But it filled with blood again. I left a gap for the blood to drain. Adam was struggling for his life. He didn't say anything. His eyes were closed. He just kept struggling for air. You get a bit of a bond with somebody when they're dying in front of you. It's just you and them. in their last moments, and you're hoping, and you're trying to give them hope with confidence, and in the meantime, you've got the traffic just crawling past you, feeling completely as if their day has been inconvenienced, and then they're happy to get past and to carry on with their world. I wonder, though, if Adam had looked to the left-hand side of him and seen his front passenger seat, if he'd actually seen what he'd done, what he'd caused. And maybe that reduced the motivation that he had to live. And maybe the hope that I was trying to give him just wasn't enough and he found it hopeless. If he had just looked to the left 
as the dust was settling just after the collision, he would have seen a body of a young girl. And she had an obvious head injury. And that was Anna, and Anna was 21. She was looking up into the sky, but there was no pained expression on her face. There was no struggling for air like Adam, just this peace, peaceful serenity across her face. But her eyes had no focus. I knew that the car had slammed into the back of the highways lorry and had spun off. I know that Anna was killed immediately. She was gone before I'd even got there. Her body, still dressed in the clothes that she wore the night before. I remember her bare feet and the footwell with the flip-flops next to them. It's strange because when you talk about these instances with colleagues or with home, at home, you get a mental picture of the scene. It's not a video you run through your mind, it's a snapshot really. And I couldn't work out why with Anna's it was her bare feet and her flip-flops in the footwell. And I soon realised, I guess, that it's because that sort of thing signifies holidays, sunny beaches and happy times. And here it was, a scene of complete death, destruction and devastation. That's why it sticks in my mind. So what had happened? Well, Anna had gone to a party in Uffcombe with her boyfriend, but she wanted to come home early. So she arranged with a mutual friend, and that was Adam to come back. But Adam had been drinking. The car was in good condition, a clean license, he was insured, there's no problems. But Adam was twice over the drink driving limit and Anna didn't realise that. She got into the car and it cost her her life. You see it doesn't end there does it? Because Adam wasn't a bad lad. Adam lived with his dad and he was a trainee electrician and his dad now lives alone. Anna, well her boyfriend came home expecting to see Anna there and instead there was a police officer welcoming him home. And then you've got Anna's mum. Then you've got Anna's mum who lost a beautiful, talented and very happy daughter that day. And I promise you she'll never get over that. I mentioned earlier to keep in the back of your minds, this, the tragedy of this was no different from the other 150 that I've attended. And I wouldn't be wasting my time talking to you now if I didn't think you could prevent it happening to yourselves. So when you're in a passenger in the car and you feel uncomfortable, you must have the confidence, the strength of mind to say, slow down. Hit their ego by all means, tell them that you feel sick. And then, if you need to, ring a parent to, co to collect you. Believe me, they won't feel angry. They'll be so relieved. And if you're the driver, do me a favour. Try to be the smoothest driver that you can possibly be. Don't be the fastest. And that way, you won't have to live through the rest of your life having the guilt that you've killed another human being, like so many people I've seen in the past.